You want to make sure that people know, oof, this woman is a, is a No luck with gold. I think they must have thought that I have too much gold at home that I don't <laughs> need another championship. I did get moved to the WWE alumni page. What on earth is going on? Unfortunately, I took quite a few blows to the head. We all know the risks that we take, but we take those risks because we have a dream and we have a passion for wrestling. Welcome to Beer and this is DS, and today we've got very special guest here, the fashionista herself, the queen of NXT UK, Jeannie is here! And what an introduction, I love that. The fashionista is here, the queen's here, so I had to dress up, you know, I didn't want to be shaded. Honestly, sweetheart, what on earth are you wearing? You look fabulous. Thank you, thank you. Well, this is such an honor to have you because I don't know if you know, but women's wrestling fans, the day we've seen you, we've been obsessed with you, we're, <laughs> we love you, and we recently heard this heartbreaking news of your retirement. We'll definitely talk about that. But I just thought it would be a really great opportunity to go through your adventure, your journey through wrestling and WWE. For me, wrestling, uh, my love for wrestling started at a very young age. I started watching wrestling um, around age nine, um, oh. just because my aunt put it on for me. She thought I was a fan, but at that time I wasn't. But then I got hooked. And so sometimes I would watch it, you know, randomly or just sort of be glued to the TV. But then at the age of 11, for me, I just, I, I, I fully fell in love with wrestling. And the rest is sort of history. I never fell out of love with it. I've heard that Jushin Liger is your favorite wrestler. Oh, I love Jushin. He is... Yeah. Honestly, he's absolutely in incredible. I'm curious, like, what, what are some of the women's wrestlers that really inspired you? Um, for me, uh, women's wrestlers, when I was growing up, obviously Trish and Lita. You know, they're, they're the trailblazers and, you know, they made history and they, they really shattered the glass ceiling for, for the women of now. But also there are some people who I feel that not go under the radar, but don't get the recognition as much as they deserve. The Jazzes, the Ivories. You know, and they, they were absolutely incredible. And those are just to name a few. I, I remember actually um, when, I, when I was b a big fan of Trish and I remember watching her feud with Jazz. And it was just incredible because she was just so physical, so vicious. And I was like, yeah. this, this is a bad, you know, and I, and I liked it. It's nice. It's nice to see a different side of a woman. Maybe that's where you got all your viciousness from. Because <laughs> I see it. I see it. So when did you start training for wrestling, actually? I actually didn't start training until I was in my 20s. Mm. I wanted to start when I was 18. I, I looked into it. I didn't know much about, like, the, the UK scene. But obviously, I, I grew up as a WWE fan. So I knew that their, their feeder school was at that time OVW and yeah. they were based in Louisville, Kentucky. And I, I researched about it and I was like to my family, okay, this is it. I'm going to move. I'm going to Louisville, oh. Kentucky. <laughs> and I was 18. And then I just, I just didn't have the, the nerve to follow through with it because, you know, props to anyone who does do it, but moving from one country to another, especially like with that amount of distance between like right. home, it's, it's a big change, it is. So I respect people who did it, but for me, I was just like, I don't think I can do it. So instead, I just worked, and then I wanted to decide what I wanted to study at university, and then I went to uni, I studied, I graduated, I worked for a short time, and I was like, I just have to do it. If I, if I don't do it now, I will end up looking back and, and truly regretting it. Wow, yeah, that's something I wanted to like talk about because if the Wikipedia is right, your first match was probably when you were like around 26, 27. I feel like that's kind of different from a lot of the wrestler that starts off so early, like Paige Soraya always talks about how she was wrestling in the womb. So yeah. how was walking into your first match? It's still very young, but like later than a lot of your peers. I, I don't think I've really thought about it, if, if I'm honest, because wrestling has so many you know different people of different yeah. ages I just felt accepted and there were people my age there were people who were older so it was just sort of like a, a mixed group and um, like just like you said Soraya and also like Tony as well she started when she was 13 looking back I almost wish I started a little bit younger just because I would have had more experience and knowledge under my belt but mm -hmm. I started at a later age and I was very fortunate to be given the opportunities that I that I got given. You know, I wrestled at Progress, OTT, yeah. Rev Pro, and I was learning and growing and developing in front of everybody. So I didn't really have that time to sort of do it 
in front of 30 people. I think that's really inspirational for a lot of people who want to change their career or chase their dream later in their life. Thank you. You know, there's something about you that just draws in women's wrestling fans. Your irresistible charm, <laughs> your charisma, but one of it has to be your fashionista gimmick. So how did that gimmick come about? So I was at training and I started at Progress's wrestling school. It was called the Projo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would do, in training, we would do like the basics and then sometimes the then owner, John Briley, would come in and would have to do like promo classes and stuff. And he came in and he wanted to see people cut a promo. And at that time, I think, if I'm correct in saying, I think I was only about three, maybe three-ish months in, into my training. Okay. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna have to, to wing it. And I did a promo, <laughs> we did like a sort of like face to face and I did it with another guy and um, I just cut a heel promo, it just sort of just came out. And he was like, I like that, like, you know, your hillside and stuff. And then he said, you need to come up with a character. Mm. And I was like, okay, what do I like? So I can make it as organic as possible. Yeah. So I looked at all these different things that I liked and I wanted to be a little bit different, especially uh, in England as well. And I was like, well, I love fashion. I've always loved fashion. So yeah. why don't I, you know, come up with a fashion Easter gimmick and look at everyone like they're trash um, make them feel worthless <laughs> and make myself, you know, seem like I'm above them because it's a great way to get heat. And, and I love fashion as well. So it was so much fun to be able to, I would, I don't want to say me because I'm not a bitch, <laughs> but, but, but me in the sense of, I, I love fashion so I can have fun with it. I can run with it. I think I heard the other interview where you had, you know, Chanel bag from your like school days. What was the first really big purchase that you made? A Gucci bag for school. For school? Is that true? <laughs> so we had to write a little, little bit of a backstory for our character. Okay. And um, it was not true. Oh. I think my, pa my parents would be appalled if like at a young age I would go okay. in with an expensive bag. They would be like, you are not taking an expensive bag to school. <laughs> I, I sort of came up with that. Um, yeah. I actually said that I uh, fired my, got my nanny fired because <laughs> she said to me, no, you can't take it in. But yeah, it was just sort of just having fun with the character and adding layers and stuff. And I, I liked the fact that, you know, I had a little bit of a backstory so I could sort of, you know, play with different layers of the character of Ginny and the fashion Easter and just sort of draw back from like, experiences. I mean, I fully believe that because whenever you're wearing your everyday clothes, your couture in your segments and promo, you look so chic, so posh. I was like, yes, she Thank is you. real life fashionista. But I want to talk about your gear because for a fashionista gimmick, I think your gear, it doesn't have bells and whistle. It's very mm -hmm. simple design and muted yes. colors. So when I, again, when I started, um, because I didn't have a, a wealth of experience and I sort of had to, to start in front of everyone playing around with things it, it just sort of like for me I was just experimenting so my character was a fashionista I didn't want to wear wrestling gear so I was like why would a fashionista want to wear wrestling gear so I was like okay I'm going to wear normal clothes so I would wear play suits Oh. Um, and then I would, you know, play around with the different play suits. Okay, can I add this? Okay, can I add that? Does this color work? That color work? All of the things that um, a lot of people get to do in front of a smaller audience, <laughs> I had to do <laughs> in front of a larger audience. But that's fine. And that's great yeah. because it allowed me to work under pressure. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't really, I would say, until... Um, the May Young Classic, and then um, not last year, but the year prior, before the injury happened, that's when I really came into my own of, you know, this is the gear that I want. You know, mm. this is the gear that, that fits me and suits that character. It's so chic. I love it. Like, it doesn't Thank have to you. have all the sparkles and colors. It's just chic. Love it. European fashion. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a fashionista, aside from yourself, of course, who do you think in WWE has, like, very fashionable gear? Honestly, there's actually quite a few women that, that definitely have some amazing gear. Yeah. Charlotte. 
Mm. Uh, Maxine Dupree as well. I know she doesn't have ring gear, but you know the way she presents herself yeah. is it's beautiful. She she knows how to to dress. Mm-hmm. Um, Tiffany Stratton as well. Uh, recently, yeah. her her NXT gear um, for her return was amazing. I'm trying to think, my mind's sort of gone blank. But off the top <laughs> of my head, those are the ones that really stand out to me. So you know, you dominated the UK indie scene, and then you finally made your way into WWE brands. So you were in May Young Classic. You were also in WrestleMania. How was that process like for you? Oh, it was. Surreal. As a WWE fan growing up, obviously your ultimate goal is to be signed by the WWE. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate when I came into wrestling that a few years after NXT UK launched, and that allowed people within the UK rather than, and not even just the UK, within Europe, um, not having to have to move to America but still be part of the, the brand and, and that was amazing. I actually did wrestle for WWE though prior to being signed. It was in 2017. It was me and Tony Storm and we wrestled at Access three right. times in a row at the same match. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a little bit of experience and then in 2018, just before um, NXT UK launched and they were getting their roster together, that's when I got the call. And yeah, it was it was amazing. I remember getting the call because I actually had a career outside of wrestling. Oh. And um, I was at work and mm-hmm. I run into a meeting room to, to pick up this call because it was a US number. And I was like, this is it. I think I, I, I know what it is because I knew that there was talks. I knew that, you know, they had eyes on certain people and I kn- my name was mentioned. And then I just quickly ran into the, the meeting room and I was like, hello. <laughs> And the rest, again, it's it's history. And what did you think about NXT UK happening instead of, you know, maybe going to more traditional route as going to NXT, the US brand or main roster? I think it was great. You had the best of both worlds. You're um, at home in the UK. And, you know, for those who are coming from mainland Europe, it's not too far of a, a mm-hmm. journey for them. And then you also, at a certain point, you, you got to wrestle some UK indies. Yeah. So you were having the best of both worlds. And for someone like me, who, when I did get signed, I was only three years in, you know, continuing to work some of the promotions, it was, it was very important because I needed to get reps under my belt. But, but it was great. It was a great experience because everyone knew everyone. We'd all worked on the independence together. So it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. One of the first things that really hooked us into you when we were watching NXT UK was your finishers. You know, Touch of Couture and then Makeover. How did you come up with these amazing finishers? So um, the makeover was my first ever finisher and it was at training and it was at the end of 2014 when I was getting ready to to debut a couple of months Mm. after. I hadn't, I didn't have a finisher, and I was training with um, with with the people there, and uh, it was a guy called Tom Moran who actually had been shown that finisher, and he was like, "Oh, look at this! I think this would be a great finisher for you." And I tried it, and I was like, "Oh, I love it! It's devastating! It's brutal! It's different!" And then um, the other one was uh, when I was training in Birmingham with Chris Brooks, and he came up with that that finisher for me. It was like a the, the rainmaker into a, a capo, which was, again, different. And I also love that the face buster was your finisher because we all know that face buster is like the default diva finisher. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> so the fact that you elevated it, both divalicious but also vicious, it's just, that's why we love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You need that as a thing. When it comes to a finisher, you know, I, I, I don't want it to look too pretty. You want yeah. it to look devastating, especially if you are a heel and you want to, you want to make sure that people know, oof, this, this woman is a, <laughs> is a bitch, you know, yeah. so... That is almost like a little bit of a stamp. So speaking of bitch, <laughs> your entrance, <laughs> your entrance is so cool. Like the way you just strut down and the death stare. You're just looking down upon everyone in that arena. First of all, how do you do that death stare? It's like, what's the tip? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always remember when I first came out mm-hmm. for uh, Progress, it was... Um, an Endeavour show, so it was their version of a, a trainee show. 
and the the entrance way it was oh gosh it was quite long actually you had to walk around so they had a balcony and okay. then you had to walk there walk around the balcony down the stairs wow. and sort of yeah and then, then there's more fans around the ring and I was like I really need to just like I really need to take this like to, to another level. I really need to make a statement because no one knew who I was. I was just like, I really need to make sure people know I'm horrible. So I looked at people, I looked them up and down, I made sure that they felt worthless and that I thought I was above them. And I just ran with it and then I just continued to elevate it. And I would, you know, at some points I would stop on the stage and I would look at everyone. And then in other entrances, I would, again, I would stop on the stage, look at everyone, walk down. Maybe I'd catch the eye of like someone trying to heckle me and I'd uh -huh. make sure that I, I give them like a nasty stare because sometimes <laughs> the actions, you know, and, and your facial features, they speak so much louder than yeah. words. So yeah. you need to sort of play with it. And it was fun. I, I, I really enjoyed that. I love it. I love it. Sometimes I walk like that, inspired <laughs> by you. So when I posted that I'm doing an interview with you, I got hundreds of fan submitted questions. There's so many. And a lot of them were fans that were so proud of your interview. Indian heritage and they also wanted you to talk a little bit about you know working with aspiring Indian wrestlers in WWE India tryout. I think it's very important one of the most important things for me when I came into wrestling was never to be a stereotype within the UK and Europe it was very easy to do it's very you know the UK is very multicultural one of the messages I wanted to sort of put forward to the world in general was you know where where there are pet areas where it's not as diverse you know, those stereotypes that one might have associated with someone are most of the time not true. <laughs> Yeah. So I wanted to show that it, regardless of your ethnicity, your heritage and stuff, you know, we're still human beings. I'm very proud of my heritage. I'm very proud of being British as well. And I get to represent the best of both worlds, it's, which, <laughs> yes. is, which is great. I, but I do think representation is so important because wrestling allows people to spread a very important message and I think through wrestling you can almost tackle you cannot almost you can tackle stereotypes and you can tackle racism and that for me was was very important and again I was always given that opportunity just to be me I didn't have to pretend that I was um, from India or, or from another country I got to be from where I actually am from. The the tryout was really fun. Um, I remember getting asked to, to help and um, going there and seeing, like it was my first ever tryout that I ever helped with and going there and seeing like the passion and determination and sort of like being able to, you know, put a, a little stamp in there, you know, with someone who has somewhat experience. It was, it was fun. I remember like just the energy just being so electric and everyone being so passionate, even if people weren't, weren't as good and they ha didn't even have experience. Everyone was just there. They were just cheering each other on. And, and that was fun. That was fun to be part of history as well, because not a lot of people realize that in India, wrestling is huge. I think outside of uh, America, I think one of their biggest deals is in India. There's a lot of fans there. They're very passionate because, you know, they don't really get many shows going over to India regularly so when when people are there they just I don't know they just blow the roof off they just enjoy it <laughs> now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the favorite moments of NXT UK a lot of people mentioned your alliance with alpha female Jazzy Gabbard and that alliance was just so strong I remember being asked to to, to work with her and uh, it was definitely something different because in NXT UK, I was always a lone wolf. On the indies, I would either be a, a, like on my own or I would have people with me. But in NXT UK, I was just I was just me. And our characters are they're very different. Yeah. So I needed to sort of figure out a way that we can work together and sort of make it work. But we don't want to go down a route that's already been done. So we played around with a few things and just sort of ran with it. I mean. The good thing with WWE, 
with me personally, I never had any of my promos written. I got to write my own promos. I got to say what I wanted to say. So I sort of got to play around when, when I introduced her, when I done promos with her. I got to play around with a with a few things, but it was fun. It was it was it was definitely something different. It was different to um, my partnership that I had with Laura Di Matteo in progress because obviously yeah. Laura and Jazzy are two completely different characters. Um, but yeah, it was fun. Again, it was just it was just a new challenge. This is more of a recent match, but your amazing championship match against Meiko Sadomura. How is it like to face the final boss of Japan, come and work with NXT UK talents and become a champion there? Oh, sh- oh she yeah. is absolutely amazing. I actually had worked with Miko before in Progress. Um, she was the Progress women, Women's Champion at that time, and I had returned back and I had a match with her, and I... I I managed to win the the Progress Wrestling Women's Championship back, which was yeah. great. And I remember going into that match first and being like, "Wow, okay, this is a legend." You know, yeah. she's one of the best wrestlers, regardless of you know man, woman. She's just she's amazing, and she was so sweet to work with. She's such mm. a nice person. She's so humble and down to earth, and that made the experience less daunting because you just felt like you were working with a friend. And then when we got to to wrestle in NXT UK, I was like, okay, this is it. I've got to, you know, I've got to take it to a, another level now. Like yeah. I fa- I'm in my groove of like, you know, my ring gear and stuff. You know, I've, I've you know, developed a, a new layer of attitude. I want to continue to elevate myself. And, you know, she, she done great. She helped me a lot as well and made me look great. But yeah, working with, with Miko, it's, it's great. You learn so much from... Um, behind the scenes with her, but being in the ring with her, you learn even more. When that match was happening, I remember the whole Twitter, uh, everyone was like, this is the time for Jeannie to finally win the NXT UK (laughs) Women's Championship. But surprisingly, no luck with gold. Honestly, I think they must have thought that I have too much gold at home that I don't (laughs) need another championship. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) I'm honestly like, I'm very fortunate um, on the independence with Progress and Rough Pro that I was, you know, and, and also um, Chaos Wrestling as well, where, you know, I did win championships. I was given the opportunity. With WWE, it was... Obviously, everyone wants to be champion. Yeah. Because, you know, when you when you begin wrestling and you want to, to have a career and you want to live your dream, you always want to be the best version of yourself. And, you know, having a championship almost gives you that, that seal of approval. It, it sucks, but it's also great at the same time that I got the opportunity to do things like main event with Tony Storm. You know, the first ever women's main event for the NXT UK Women's Championship. I got to face Kaylee again, someone who's an incredible athlete. I got to face Miko, and it was fun. Like, the chase is always fun because I love storytelling as well. But why... Who knows? But Who knows? it was, it was, I really enjoyed it. It was great. We should launch an investigation into this because I am mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> NXT UK closed, which was a shocking news for everyone. What was your thought and what was like other wrestlers in that run? What was like the atmosphere there? So I, I was injured at that point. So um, I, I wasn't actually there when, mm-hmm. when, you know, sort of everything happened. I, I, I got told about it and I knew about it after. Um, actually straight after because they they announced it but for me NXT UK should have always been NXT Europe Mm. because not everyone is from the UK true yeah Uh, we're from all over Europe and the UK is in Europe as well and um, even though obviously all the shows were based in the UK and stuff I think it should have been NXT Europe because it just opens up even more doors Mm. Um, business wise, you know, you always have to think 10 steps ahead. WWE is, is, a, is a company. They want to generate more money. They want to generate more fans. And now going within Europe, not just the UK, but going to, to Ireland, to, in the UK, they're going to, to different parts of Europe. It's just going to bring more fans. And it's great because European fans... They're, they're absolutely amazing. They yeah. make so much noise. They're so passionate. It's, it, I think it's a good thing. It's sad when anyone loses their jobs mm-hmm. because you don't want that to happen to anyone. And there, are, there definitely are so many talented people who were signed to NXT UK, but it also gives even more people an opportunity going forward. And then since the closing, you know, a lot of the 
next to UK superstars, you know, some more consistent and some more not, but they have moved to NXT US brand. Who do you think will really shine? Um, I think Alba is is a great wrestler. When I watch her, and, and I because I know her and I've wrestled her in, yeah. in WWE and also on the, on the indies as well, you know, I feel like she's got a lot to offer the women's mm. division. So I think she definitely, you know, can take the ball and run with it. And, you know, definitely they need to have Mako on TV as well because she's a legend. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she she's a legend. And again, she'll have, you know, bring in a new audience of fans yeah. on the product as well. Were there any discussions or plans for you to move to NXT, the US side or WWE main roster? Because fans were so curious about it. So at that point, because when, when NXT UK had closed, I was yeah. injured. So my main priority and work's main priority was always just get better. You're mm -hmm. fine. Um, I did get moved to the WWE alumni page and I messaged work and I was like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> and they were like, I'm so sorry, it's just because you're injured, so they've just moved you there. Uh, but they were like, they shouldn't have moved you there. I was like, okay, good. I was like, I hope you haven't fired me without telling me. But uh, my main focus at that point was really just to get better. Obviously, personal goals, you have to set yourself personal goals within mm -hmm. any career. You know, yeah. I wanted to, to make it to the next stage, take it to the next level, etc. But I just needed to get better. I'm glad that you talked about that alumni situation because everyone was freaking out. But <laughs> other, other kind of headline that came out during that time was that there's a rumor going around that you will be joining Maximum Male Models as Maxine Dupree role. <laughs> Did you hear anything about it? So I, I would actually get messages from like my friends as well <laughs> saying that is this you this is so cool this is this is your character this would suit you down to a t and i was like no nope, i'm still injured yeah. <laughs> so i i hadn't yeah. i hadn't heard anything about it but yes i i do remember seeing you know the tweets and stuff and being like less like it would be a fun character to play but i was like no i'm, I'm out i'm injured now we have to talk about your shocking announcement the heartbreaking announcement for a lot of the women's wrestling fans and the fans that supported you you announced your retirement. So when I was injured, th uh, this was actually the longest time that I have been out with any injury. Mm. And during the the time of being injured and the, having the symptoms, I was just like, oh wow, this is just taking so long for my body to, to heal. The injury that I actually had, it was a concussion. Unfortunately, I took quite a few blows to the head and it was the worst one that I ever had. And halfway through, I was like, if my body is taking this long to, to heal, if I get hit again, you know, is it going to take even longer? And I, I just had to be smart about it. I love wrestling. You know, I'm a wrestling fan. I always will be. And it was a really hard decision because if it wasn't for that, would I be wrestling still? Yes. But your health is wealth. Yeah. And as difficult as it is, and as much as I love this business, and you know, I, as much as I was like, oh, maybe I'll be okay, I had to be smart about it and make sure that I look after myself, not just for now, but in the long run as well. Obviously, you had an incredible career, but everyone that has followed your career all the way from progress knows that you've wrestled everyone that's like the top of the industry right now. Do you feel like you haven't tapped the full potential in WWE? Because a lot of fans totally believe so. I was very, very lucky in WWE in the sense that um, I had always pretty much had a storyline. I was trusted enough to be able to, to continue with my character, to, to take her in different directions and stuff. And I was really grateful for that. Um, in comparison to people like Tony Storm and Alba Fire, um, I, I didn't have that much experience. Like I was saying earlier, I had to sort of grow in front of everybody's eyes rather than having five years experience prior, already know who I am as a wrestler and, you know, have everything, so, not everything because you're continuously learning, yeah. but having a lot of da things down. So then when I came into 20, 2021, um, that's when I really started to to fully have things down a little bit more solidly. Mm -hmm. And I had more experience in the ring, things were a little bit smoother and stuff, and I felt like I was, you know, I was running with it. I was, I had a fire yeah. under me, I was enjoying it, and then 
unfortunately I got I got injured. This entire discussion, I see like this burning passion and love for wrestling. <laughs> so I feel like everyone's curious. The retirement match is how a lot of wrestlers kept their career. It's like an opportunity for fans to say goodbye to you. Do you think that's something that you might be considering? Oh, I d right now, I, I, I don't know. Um, okay. I don't want to take a chance and then get hurt, but never say never. So okay. you never know what's around the corner. But right now, I just need to <laughs> focus on, <laughs> on my health, even though I'm healed and I'm fine, I'm, you know, I'm cleared right. and everything. Uh, right now, I just need to just focus on health-wise, but never say never. Never but say never. But would I fully come out of retirement and have like a, another stint? Uh, no, I just okay. I don't want to take that chance. It, and it's unfortunate, but you know it, it is what it is. When we get into this business, whether you sign with a big company or you work on the indies, we yeah. all know the risks that we take. Yeah. But we take those risks because we have a dream and we have a passion for wrestling. Mm -hmm. So it happens, but again, like looking back on everything, I, I had so much fun, I really did. And um, I'm very, very grateful for everything. I've come out of wrestling, you know, I met my husband in wrestling, I met some great friends in wrestling, and I got to work with some amazing people and all of those companies like, like Progress and Eve, um, Eve Pro Wrestling and Rev Pro OTT and all of that, like they gave me opportunities you know, when I was so new and they still believed in me, you know, when I was experimenting with my ring gear, ex you know, <laughs> trying to work on the basics and stuff in the ring and still training and stuff, but they still gave me an opportunity. So, you know, yes, it would always be nice to come out of retirement and achieve more, but looking back, I achieved so much and I'm very, very grateful. That's so interesting to me that you were keep saying that you were developing. But for us fans, you were always so polished. That's <laughs> why it was like, wow, <laughs> I didn't even realize. They say that swans are always elegant on top of the water, but they're like paddling underwater. <laughs> so That's that exactly seems what like, it was, a yeah. swan. <laughs> I know that a lot of wrestlers hate this question, but what would you say is your favorite match of your career? <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. Definitely um, my last match with Mako uh, in NXT UK. Yeah. Because again, I had started to, to get it more so wrestling it. wise. So I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, Pro Wrestling Eve, wrestling Nina Samuels, who's one of my best friends. Um, that was that was great. I really enjoyed that because we weren't on the actual pay per view at that time and we got free reign and we had fun with it. My match with Tony Storm as well. Like wrestling Tony, even though age wise she's younger than me, she still had such a wealth of knowledge and she helped me a lot. I enjoyed all my feuds feuds with her. Um, I, w I, w I wouldn't actually say just one one Tony Storm match, I'd say pretty much all of them I really, oh. really enjoyed. The other thing about you is that you're a total package. You're great in the ring, but you are a great promo, the character, the stare, the fashion. <laughs> is there a future in pro wrestling, you know, potential non-wrestling roles? Is that something you're considering? Right now, um, I'm just sort of like, coming to terms with the retirement and stuff yeah. like that and I I left with you know on very good terms they were very good yeah. to me when I said you know I need to, to step away from the ring who knows what's down the down the road right now I've just I've just retired and stuff like that I just need to sort of gather my bearings and yeah there's always opportunities and stuff like that but who knows I might be on a TV screen you know in, in a year a year's time the world's, right. the world's your oyster, you just have to run with opportunities when they're given to you. We will be waiting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ginny, for this amazing, incredible interview. Thank what do you, you. want to tell the fans that are obsessed with you, they are supporting you? What do you want to tell the fans? Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, at the end of the day, as much as we give fans a death stare and, and stuff like that, they, <laughs> they are the reason why we get to live our dream. And it's it's wonderful. It really, really is. And I'm so grateful for all the, the the beautiful comments that I've seen on Twitter. People saying really nice stuff. And I had so much fun. And I thank them for being vocal. I thank them for booing me. And you know, who, who knows? Again, like the fashionista in a year's time might be on a TV screen near them. But uh, yeah, I'm just very, very grateful.